Welcome to the Fabulous 413. I'm Khalees Smith. And I'm Monty Belmonte. I know we were supposed to have Governor Healy on today, but she had to postpone because she was a little busy. You know, when you look at the Connecticut, for example, and just how brown it is, I mean, you see the, the sediment and just, you know, you can you can see, you know, what's happened in terms of erosion and what that has done. Uh, you can see the flooding that's still, and I know we've had a couple days where, where waters have receded, but they're still very high. And so, you know, it gives you a very good sense of what was actually here and what people are still dealing with. That's the governor assessing flood damage in Williamsburg this morning. Thanks to NEPM's Jill Kaufman for the audio. Monty also spent most of today assessing flood damage with farmers at Grow Food Northampton. Yes, folks, I'm um, Courtney Whiteley. Me and my son, where are miss? He am gone to the chuck. Yeah, me and my two boys, them work this plot here. To be honest, I've been planting eggplant several years now, maybe about 10 years. This year, was the best crop. As you can see, it it just come on the water. It's like, and for just one, in just one night, and everything change. Yeah. It's just a farm, a farmer part of life, you know. Mm. Yeah, farming is hard. If it's not drought, it's rain. Mm. If it's not rain, it's flood. So we can't predict it. And we just have to try again, try next year. You know, I wanted water, but I never want so much. You know, if I didn't know I was getting so much water, I would, be, I would, I would have built a boat, you know, like now. Speaking with Elisa Klein, who's the director of Grow Food Northampton here in Northampton, where a bunch of community farms are located on one plot of land, a bunch of community gardens are located on one plot of land, and they're all very close to the river, which crested its banks on Monday. So the water receded the first day pretty much and then we have some puddles but the rest has been drying out for the last two days so you know it's still you can feel it's squishy but it's not you know like actively muddy in most places. The farmers here in this parcel lost pretty much in total all their crop so we have four farms here. Here in what we call our south parcel all the crops pretty much are gone. Three quarters of the community garden was also submerged so the gardeners can't harvest 275 plots. Wow. <laughs> and then over... Out of how many? Out of 325. Yeah, so that's a huge percentage. Yeah. yeah. And then we have another huge parcel over there. We call it our main field. We have three farms, Crimson and Clover lost a water pump, a third of one of the farms, the New Family Farm, which is our cooperative of Somali Bantu refugee families, they lost a third of their uh, their farm. And then Joe Sikowski, who has a 40-acre plot up Meadow Street, also had his field submerged. And then Ross Hill Homestead, that we also leased to for their goats and chickens, they were completely flooded. Their chicken coop and their goat pens were completely ruined, so they're rebuilding those from scratch. Their animals were okay. They got them to safety, but they are still kind of mucking around in mud, and they're trying to clean that up, and we're going to be helping them on Saturday to do that. A lot of loss. Pat James. I'm the garden manager. So the Giving Garden, which we share with Starlight Center, a lot of the infrastructure for watering went down. Fencing and netting and all the crops besides. I mean, yeah, we were coming out, putting out thousands of pounds of food every year out of that plot. And that's for donation to food pantries. So eight to 9,000 pounds of food is basically gone that would have been donated to people who are food insecure in Northampton. I know Mountain View Farm in East Hampton is not part of Grow Food Northampton purview, but they're also a huge donator to, say, the Food Bank of Western Mass. And, and it had the most heart, most heartbreaking. Paul Schul, who's one of the Valley's best photographers, if I do say myself, what you were there at Mountain View yesterday, and what did you see? We went down to their field in Arcadia. I mean, the tragic thing was that it was ready to pick today and absolutely beautiful crops. That's all underwater at this point. Like literally underwater. I heard literally I heard tell their first missive was saying that they were swimming to the field. Literally yeah, Ben swimming. literally swam out yesterday. I was going to get a kayak this morning, but the... Ben Peralt is one of the yeah, farm owners. No point at this, at this time because it's gone. Song Sparrow Farm, where the, you see the infrastructure there. When Tony was walking out, they were chest deep in water. Wow. So we're talking three feet. At, no, least. at least, yeah. 
It was Probably about four, four feet of water. Wow. Yeah. And All all of this covered. It looks totally dry and gorgeous right now. It looks like you could go pick whatever this you want. This is the weird thing about these kinds of disasters. You know, it can be one day later and you kind of look around and it's like, right. oh my God, there's so much beauty. It's sunny. But I mean, you take your car to the mechanic and it's not making that noise anymore. <laughs> <laughs> the governor shows up and you're like, I swear to God, it was four feet of water exactly. two days ago. <laughs> exactly. It actually felt quite dangerous to me. When I arrived, there were interns in the water and they were coming out and I felt like I wanted them to come out much sooner and for like all the cars that were parked here to just immediately evacuate rather than sit here and watch it. What's your name? Suna. And what do you do? Uh, I am a farmer at Flower Work Farm. Which is one of the farms that's here at Grove Food It is, yeah, right near the right near the river. A farmer was here and said, hey, you better get here. I live right around the corner and get your stuff. And I said, what do you mean get my stuff? Well, come get your stuff because the water's rising. And by the time I got here, you know, five minutes later, it was three feet deep. And I could tell that everything was lost, but they were just onlookers. And it came so quickly that I knew that as quickly as it came, it could come more and, you know, take people away. And there were dumpsters floating in the water, you know, like at, for a moment, I just felt lucky when I got home that we were safe and that no one had gotten injured. But then, you know, the aftermath of like having lost the farm. It's completely, that. totally everything. Yeah, it's completely Completely, totally gone. As listeners of this show know, we have CISA and farmers on uh, every week, community involved in sustaining agriculture. No more than this year, I think, with three major events in the last six months, uh, do we need the community to be involved if we want to sustain agriculture in the four counties of Western Mass. Margaret Christie, what do you do with CISA? I'm the special projects director at CISA. Which oh, you means... have some special projects I have some special projects, for sure. I was up yesterday at Natural Roots Farm in Conway. They're a lovely community-supported agriculture or CSA farm. They were completely completely flooded on Monday. Their crops are still in the ground, but for the most part probably are not harvestable because of food safety concerns. I think what what I noted, they were really grateful for the outpouring of support that they were already feeling. They had friends and neighbors and CSA members there in the fields, like unburying their irrigation lines and finding their equipment and tucking plants back in. Mountain View Farm is another example of a community supported farm that's put up a fundraiser already. They lost 45 acres of crops. They're seeing enormous community support. But we also have wholesale farms that play a really important role in getting Massachusetts grown produce to supermarkets and food banks and people all across the state. And they don't have those direct community connections, even though they're supplying a lot of food for people. And the other thing is, with climate change, we're going to see this over and over. So community support, the connections between people and their food and their farmers is really what we're all about. But figuring out how to solve this problem, helping these farmers come through this crisis is really a job for government. You know, we need to figure out because we're going to have to do this over and over and over again as these events get more frequent. So when you were at Natural Roots, you could see that everything had been washed away, but a potato plant is there and there are the potatoes just sitting there and now what's yeah, like a beautiful sunny day. Yeah, the soil has been washed off the roots, but I was really amazed at how much the plants were still in place, even the you know smallest new transplants. So there's, You can't use that because it's contaminated? You have to really assess that crop by crop and happily the Department of Ag Resources Produce Safety Team is going to go out there today and help them really figure out, you know, in which case some things like a pepper or a bean may not have put out its fruit yet and so that in fact you might be able to harvest if that plant you can tuck that plant back in and it can keep going so there's but at least you, a tiny bit of hope for some of these plants some of these, some things of these farms might be okay and different rivers are different the connecticut is obviously more contaminated than the south river which comes down out of ashfield and is what flooded natural roots so it is great that there is you know support for figuring out what's possible and what's not because you certainly don't want to you know give anybody food to eat that's contaminated and on the other hand if it's perfectly good, it would be great to be able to use it. Commissioner of Massachusetts Department of Agriculture, Ashley Randall, and the new deputy commissioner, Winton Pitkoff. Ashley, you grew up here. Have you ever seen anything like this? No. In in my time growing up, I haven't seen devastation to the valley like this with the flooding. I mean, certainly, I know with Hurricane Irene, there were impacts that farms experienced, but not to this level across the valley. MDAR is going to go in and be able to test some of the actual plants that are in the ground right now to see if they are, or if they're safe. Is that true, Winton Pitcock? It's, it's still to be determined. The, the, we have teams that are out visiting farms right now, and we're waiting on some protocols that are developed by the, uh, by the federal government because they have the resources to, to make those determinations. We don't know what was in the water. Our primary concern is making sure that any food that gets out and is available for public consumption is safe.
this really highlights climate change. And a lot of times when we've thought about climate here, we've thought about the drought and how we'd be responsive to that. And now that's really repositioning our thinking with floods and extreme weather conditions when there's rainfall like this, how we can make our grant programs and our technical assistance available to be ready to assist in these type of situations. State Senator Joe Comerford from the Hampshire Franklin District, what do you feel like the state's role is at this moment in regards to helping out our farmers and what they've experienced, not just at the flooding this week, but with the frost and the warming and frost in February that killed all the peaches, with the frost of May 18th that decimated so many uh, apple crops and other crops, and now this flooding. What can you as a state senator and the state do? Well, there's three things that we can do, and we're, we're doing them all at once today, and thanks for being here. One is assessing the damage for what the state can do. You'll remember, Monty, three Julys ago, we had those terrible storms. This was really a municipal issue, and the state came through with disaster relief because we didn't hit the federal FEMA designation. We got to help. We have to come forward with state dollars for cities and towns and for farmers, and there are probably other affected businesses, right? That's number one. Number two, we've got to work together, uh, MEMA. That's the Massachusetts Emergency Management folks. Amazing. They've been here in all of our towns uh, meeting with municipal officials. They're sending people to Wendell and you know Montague. They're really assessing water sewer. They're assessing infrastructure, but they're also assessing farms. So we've got to add up the damage. I believe we may hit the 11 million uh, federal threshold, and then we have to apply for FEMA funding. And yeah, I will say, you know, Elizabeth Warren has called. Jim McGovern has called. Of course, not surprising to you, Monty. And they're saying, okay... We're ready to be tagged in. Third thing is we need technical assistance for our farmers. UMass Extension is on the move. MDAR is on the move, Mass Department of Agriculture Resources. They need to be able to talk with farmers about what crops can be saved, what crops have to be destroyed, and what to do about the kind of damage, the soil loss. And so we have to do all of those things all at once. And I, I actually think the Healy Driscoll administration is doing all those things all at once and doing it excellently. One cool bit of information that I got, I don't know how cool it is for the environment, but the governor literally flew here in a plane and took a helicopter to North Adams. So that's uh, one way to get here fast. Then I think she's going to Atlantic City, but that's just for gambling. Uh, my name is Piyush Lapsetwar. The farm I work at is called Perennial Farm, which is right by the river. And it's not a commercial farm, it's an experimental farm. Uh -huh. So it's interesting because I'm planting only perennials, trees and a wheat variety, which is perennial. So wheat, did you say? Wheat. Oh, wow. So usually all the wheat is annual, but the wheat I'm working with is perennial. And the idea for me to work right by the river is that I'm working with things which are more flood resilient. This was their first year and they were underwater, flowing water for 10 hours but they seem to have survived the flow they are bent over because of all the flow of the water but hopefully they will stand up again and so we're on a little bit of a parking lot here at grow food northampton and it is covered in dry caked mud it looks like you would see in the desert but that's because this was all underwater it left all of this silt and is now drying out in the hot sun on this pavement i'm going to introduce this group a little bit so they are a community cooperative uh, they're from somalia and they uh lease about 60 acres at this site the cooperative president his name is tero and this is a member his name is mudin nesteha she's also a member of the cooperative so in terms of what's affected as you can see the first person who owns uh, who leases this plot you can see most of it is destroyed at least four plots were flooded we have about 20 plots so 16 of them are okay. How many people are part of the cooperative? About 30 people in the cooperative and 20 of them are farming here. Other people from other places. So uh, the ones that uh, we have plots for, about 30 people, but there are still people who want to join. We just don't have enough space for them yet, but there's a lot of people. The flood, I think it went through most of the plots, but the people that are hurt the most are the ones that are closer to the river, as you can see. You know, as we've been doing this farm tour, we've seen three flights from Westover going overhead. And each of those flights is, I'm told, uh, half a million dollars is spent by the federal government. And if we could just put that money towards feeding people, it seems like a better use to me of our funding. Yeah, man, but we'll try again, man. Eternal optimist. Mm -hmm. Yeah, man, we're not stop, you know. All right, well, next year I might plant some rice. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks to farmers Courtney Whiteley, Suna Turgay, Pierce Lapsatwash.
Taro Mudin and the other Somalian families farming at the new family community farming co-op. Grow Food Northampton's Elisa Klein and Pat James. Margaret Christine from CISA photojournalist Paul Schul, Commissioner. Ashley Randall and Deputy Commissioner Winton Pitkoff from the Mass Department of Agricultural Resources and State Senator Joe Comerford for talking with us. Coming up, a more hopeful agricultural story. We'll talk with Irida Kakteranova at the Farmer's Market in Northampton about turning persecution into pierogies. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. We're at the Tuesday Market, even though you're hearing this not on Tuesday, in Northampton, right next to Thorns and right next to the parking garage, and right down the street from here, for how long did you live in a church in Northampton? Lived in a church almost three years. From when to when? From 2018 to 21. During the Trump era, as many people remember. It released in the pandemic, yo! On April Fool's Day. (laughs) Pause. (laughs) Khalees' friends are here. <laughs> now the Khalees' celebrity turn is over for the moment. Rare that I'm the one that gets recognized out in public. Usually it's you. Someone's like, hey, Monty, I haven't seen you since bloody bloody. This thing happened like eight years ago. You met my daughter. She's a giant now. <laughs> well, one of the people that I met not quite eight years ago. No. Is. Yeah. Five, almost six years ago we met each other. And it was April 18th is the first time we, yeah, April 18th of 20, 2018 is when I went into the church and you were there for the first interview. Irida Kaktiranova, originally from Russia, uh, had to take sanctuary in a church in Northampton. What made you feel like at that time that's the decision you needed to make? To uh, You were risking deportation or having to take sanctuary in Northampton, which deemed itself a sanctuary city at the time. I had to take uh, sanctuary because I uh, have researched and looked at every other option that I had uh, to stay in this country safely with my family and together with my family. But after I was told by the immigration that I had no right on my children and that I had to show up with a ticket and a passport, I had to decide at that point, what can I do to stay together and have another shot at a fight? You were in that church for about three years. When did you get out and how? I got out in April of 2021. April Fool's Day. I was also there. That's right. It was our anniversary, my husband and I anniversary. That's right. And uh, I got out. It it was interesting because in January I had a plea to President Biden and I I did that over the Washington Post. And there was 52 of us and I uh, interviewed with a few folks. And literally within two months after everybody kept on telling me, no, I don't think we have a shot. My attorney said we have a very, very low shot of winning your case. And at that point, Uh, when I received the news that my case was reopened it took me about a half a year to believe it honestly when I told my attorney because of the pandemic restrictions she still hasn't received the letter at the time yet and she said I cannot process this right now give me a second let me just think about it and then we just started working on the rest and uh, for that, I have a court hearing coming up in January of 2023. 20, 23 or 4? 24. 20, 24, I'm sorry. It's okay. Time is, time is mutable. It's a mystery. Who understands? So this Everyone coming... Everyone must stand the, alone. I hear you call my name. This upcoming year, <laughs> whichever number that is, and I will be standing in front of the judge uh, applying for a green card. But you've been here for 20 years. And you've married. been here for 20 years, married, three children, but because of the messed up political system and messed up immigration policies, which should be changed, and I will get to it in like five, 10 years, for sure. <laughs> but they need to be changed, and because of it, my family has suffer, suffered an incredible trauma because I had to go inside of a church and fight. And it was harrowing to go through that process with you on the outside and hear about, you know, people shuttling your family there, you know, you not being able to spend quality time with your family in a way that was always safe or outside of that church, ever outside of that church, really. And yet, something good has come out of your time in that church, and that is your entrepreneurship. You are wearing a t-shirt that says what? Be froggy. (laughs) It's covered a little bit in oil, just a little bit, because you know, I'm in the kitchen 24 seven. But I have started my business uh, because, you know, fundraising is is very 
hard to accept sometimes and I wanted to find my, my own way of making money and uh, while I was living inside the church so I worked out a system where I had volunteers that would uh, bring me food to make pierogies out of and I had volunteers who would go to the farmers market and I had people r approaching me people like Nate Clifford from uh, Cornucopia, Rodney Sinclair from um, River Valley Co-op and they approached me to see if I could um, possibly make the product for their store. And you're making this in the church I while in sanctuary. Because while churches have kitchens I that know. they can that can be used often in commercial enterprises. It, it still is a nice kitchen and it was just not commercialized and uh, I went through the proper inspections and called the health department and everybody came in to check it out and they, I passed the inspections. After that I did my surf safe and the allergen safe as a business owner also. Again, and all in sanctuary, not all able to leave inside. a church or you might get deported by the Trump administration and be separated from your family. The stress was immense. I did learn, however, that I function the best when it's insane and crazy. <laughs> I feel the same way sometimes. <laughs> not quite to that level that you had to experience. No, so no, no. And honestly, I look back at it and even now, just last week, I was talking to the minister of the Unitarian Society, Janet Bush, and I said, you know, it still gets tough, a lot. But I said, can you believe we did it? Because you know we did. It's a very, very difficult thing that I was told that was never done in practice, only in theory. Yeah. My case was reopened in theory, never in practice. It still gives me goosebumps that my case get, got reopened. It still gives me goosebumps on how many crowds and crowds of people have helped me throughout this. And now you're here amidst the crowds at the Tuesday market and P. Froggy. Look at the mayor coming by. Uh-oh. <laughs> She gave us a, what are you, don't Wait, turn, no, 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 don't turn no, around, sorry. Mayor. Yeah, yeah, no, she waved and walked yes. the other way. <laughs> she's doing some other interview with some oh, fancy no, camera. Someone pictures. to have yeah. that, like, visual of somebody seeing Monty, like, looking a little uncomfortable and then leaving. Yeah, that's usually a reaction I, I always go forward. Yeah, you come forward. I'm like, hey, I Monty. Actually, I yell to you from like across the street. people come forward. This is an unusual reaction, and I'm just sort of, like, basking in it. Like, oh, hey, that's new. <laughs> <laughs> Meanwhile, what did you do? <laughs> your pierogies are beloved here now at the Tuesday Market yes. and elsewhere. You started a business out of Sanctuary and yes. you're continuing with this business making pierogies yes. and more. You've got hand yes. pies over there, which you say in Russian are called? Bilishi. Uh huh. Tell uh -huh. me what's in those hand pies. So, hand pies, uh, traditionally they come with meat, uh, usually beef, pork, and onion. But I have, uh, as always, I fuse a lot of my food. I came up with a, I come up every week with a different vegetarian option. That's one of my husband's ideas. He throws, okay, what, how do, will this taste? How will that taste? I think it will be good. He comes into the kitchen and helps me out, and we try new f flavors together, and then we present it. And so far, everybody has been happy. You actually really came and uh, sold your pierogies at the asparagus festival that NEPM I puts did. on. That I, I, I had uh, pierogies, I had the hand pies, I had the galam keys. You sold out and had to go home and make more. That's right. You went to, did you go home or go to the church? I went to the church. Can't, <laughs> can't work out at home. Second home. <laughs> That's right. And is that where you're still making everything most of the time? I still, I'm still i still making everything uh, out of there. I mean, in the next year, I will start looking into possibly some kitchen space where I can grow my business even bigger, where I can uh, grow my frozen line to a, a bigger level. I am thankful to the Unitarian Society and I'm hoping that next year I will still partially be there, but in order for me to grow, I need a larger space and equipment and things like that. And you're hustling, because I've come to visit you at the Tuesday I'm Market hustling. and you were in the middle. The Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> You, you were taking a class while working here at the Tuesday Market. What was that class? I was uh, Cultivate Small Business through Babson College, and uh, Santander Bank is the one that has uh, uh, sponsored it, and I actually just graduated today. Woohoo! Congratulations. Congratulations! And I got a small grant to help me grow my business. And it's now not just in a church for people that were supporters of you while you're in the church. It's not just in the church and for people at this Tuesday Market. You're, you've expanded even more. Tell us. I about have expanded that. more. I am now in Northampton, East Hampton, Springfield, Belchertown farmers markets and I am all I also have been accepted to the Copley Square market in Boston. So I find that to be a very cool accomplishment 
because it's a tough market. Is that year round or is it just summer, just like the, the standard farmer market season? All of those markets are uh, mainly for the summer. They start ending like October, November, depending on the market. But it's excellent because by now I know my demographic, I know the, I know the crowd, and it really helps you further your business because when you listen, they accept better and mm -hmm. they give yeah. more. You have had to um, rely on a lot of our elected officials to go through this process as well, not only getting your, yourself out of sanctuary at the Unitarian Society in Northampton, but also with the business, right? Like it's been hard for you to expand the business because of your Oh yes, uh, oh yes. Uh, whenever you go for the grants, it's uh, interesting, which is, thank you for asking me that question, Monty, because I would love to meet with the governor. Governor, I will come to your office in person because that's how I operate, okay? I don't email, I don't text, I don't call. I come and I ask, and that's when you'll have to make a decision. My ask is, Small businesses only get grants so often, first of all. And secondly, unfortunately, a lot of those grants are only for our American citizens. And I'm talking like not even with a green card can you get those grants. And that's something that needs to be explored a little more and possibly come up with a grant like get a work vehicle for the, for, for the new businesses. I'm just saying there needs to be a little bit more done for the grants and I'm starting to work on what needs to be done to help us. I feel like with the recent ruling about licenses, there's a bit of a plywood ramp towards yes. that, which isn't to say yes. that like it's enough because it's not, yes. but at least like kind of the door has been open to make it more of an easy possibility now for that to, to you know, happen. You can apply for a driver's right. license regardless of your immigration status. Right, right exactly. And actually, I'm going to contact Javi, see if I can... Uh, Javier Luengo Garrido, who was yes. on our show a couple weeks yes. ago, <laughs> talking about this issue and reading from the Frederick Douglass That's Ball. right. I want to see if I can uh, volunteer because last year, as uh, people might know, I did Doctors Without Borders and I really enjoyed what I did. I helped folks uh, on the Me Mexican border, across the border, and I translated for doctors and lawyers. This, this year I'm thinking about volunteering for Drivers Without Licenses help. You were translating, I'm assuming, into Russian? Uh, it was uh, Ukrainian and Belarus folks that came from, uh, from overseas and they were trying to get into the country but couldn't get the visa, so they had to go through Mexico. And you fled Putin's Russia 20 years ago to that's come right. here to the United States. Yeah. You still have family that's there, so we won't press too much about politics uh, behind your thoughts on what's been going on there, but you do have, I think, some interesting thoughts. I am against any war. It doesn't matter what country it's in. I am against of any human dying. Uh, we need to realize that as a community, we're very close and we need to always carry that. Why fight? Why get angry? Why cause a war when everything could be figured out on a different level? And I feel awful for Ukraine. I do feel awful for the, Ukrainian, uh, for the Russian soldiers also because they are being led by lies and people are dying on both sides, not just one side. And mothers are crying, and children are left fatherless. And that's something that you cannot bring back. So in the winter, when you're not at farmer's markets, besides the co-op... There is farmer's markets in the winter. Yes. Like Grove Food Nor Northampton still has a farmer's market. Oh, that's right, it's in the senior center. Copley will not be in Copley, it will be in Somerville. So I might be looking into that one. And seeing how I'm trying to develop my uh, frozen line, that might help me through this winter. I mean, inflation is very difficult this year. People are not coming out to the farmer's markets as much. But I did notice they still go to the grocery store, so I need to work what I have. Is the frozen line up and running, or is it almost up and running? Or no, what's the process with that? Uh, well, a frozen line is already up and running. Frozen pierogies, frozen galonkis. I sell that to the River Valley co-ops. Pekarski sausage in South Deerfield. An underwriter of New England Public Media. I think the co-ops are too, actually. If they are. Uh, up in Gill, in Gill, Massachusetts. I will be going to Atlas Farms and Atkins Farms next, and possibly Randall's. I already know that Atlas Farms wants to carry my product. I'm simply to my max capacity now yeah. of producing the pierogies. I mean, I roll and roll and roll. <laughs> like I and said. I still love it. I still don't hate it. <laughs> Literally also, the monkeys, you. no one said anything okay. about that. Do hey. you have any over there right now? Oh, yeah. Irida Kaktiranova, originally from Russia, living in the United States for 20 years, lived in sanctuary in a church at the Unitarian Society Unitarian of Northampton, where you're making your pierogies for pifrogi, which it looks like the letter P, 
apostrophe, apostrophe froggy, froggy with and the, the, uh, it's the called long that. Do you remember why it's called that, Monty? Because I told you last year, but do you remember? Is it because your kids said it? Yes, that, that's oh, right. Yes. My son said that. <laughs> <laughs> and I wanted the people also to know that I am going to be starting a crowdfunding campaign in the next month through CISA because I joined CISA and I became a local hero and I'm going to be starting a GoFundMe to see what else I can do to further my business that way. What's the most broken or distancing part of the immigration process that you've encountered so far? It was shocking to me that after living here for so many years, paying taxes and doing everything the way the country asks you, that I still had no weight. That when I called the immigration offices, they told me, next time you are coming here, you are being shipped up. That's the broken part. That was the surprise. And when I turned to every single attorney, and normally, you know, the, uh, the attorneys, they could vary in pricing. Usually the higher they are in the pricing, the more willing they are to pick up your case. Not necessarily will they do a great job. Even that said, nobody wanted to pick up my case, nobody to pick up my issue. It's difficult. And when it comes to uh, another difficult issue with immigration, they say pro bono lawyers, no such thing with immigration. There is no such thing. Pro bono means they will give you the advice for free, but you still have to pay for the forms. And the forms start at 500 and up. So where are you supposed to pull that out? So I'm hoping in the future, in the next 10, 15 years, that I can build some kind of a company that could help immigrants get money for the forms. What do you want listeners of this show and New England Public Media to know about what you've had to go through leaving Russia, coming here, immigration process, super hustle to try to be a, an entrepreneur, to get something going while you're afraid that you're going to get deported and be separated from your family? What do you want the people that are listening to know? I want people to know that uh, when you switch countries, you leave so much behind. It is already difficult as it is just leaving all that you know and familiar with behind uh, a lot of us in, in me personally it was a good choice to be in this country and to to grow as a person russia is not like that but it was difficult coming here a different language answering phones was one of the difficult tasks for me because it was not funny at all but people would make fun of you on the phone like you know talk back to you and it was silly but nonetheless my husband is american so my english started improving quite fastly if that's the right way to say it the dictionary would say that it's fine well as my professor said i made up a word for <laughs> Now we're going to advocate to get that in the dictionary. But I got to trademark that, so don't steal it. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we have to have more activity of it before it shows up in the dictionary, yeah, so, we gotta, so start using it. And publish an edited text. With other people. Yeah. But yeah. I, I, want, I want the governor, I want the people, I want everyone to know that it is difficult when you come from a different country. The language, the not having anybody, no mommy, no daddy, nobody, no, no family that will bring you up, that will help you when you are starting something new, that will uh, tell you, okay, you got this, or here is this, I can help you with that, I can volunteer with that. With me, the community stepped in. With me, my husband stepped in. With me, my father-in-law stepped in, and my son, and my children, you know, everybody is stepping in and do doing what they can. I am fortunate on that. But some of us don't have the community around them to help, so we rely on things like grants and officials to help us. I can speak from experience that Irida is not really hand pies, but hand pies, hand pies for those of us who don't speak Russian at Pifrogi are absolutely delicious. So go get one when you're at the Tuesday market. Up next, a much maligned word gets a bit of a comeuppance. And maybe gets to keep its place in the dictionary. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Emily Brewster, resident wordster, residing in Greenfield, but our resident wordster from Merriam-Webster in Springfield. We've had a couple of listener questions over the last couple of weeks. One that we'll get to next week from Claire Morneau, who wants to hear about meaning slippage between the words craven and mortified. But we also had a listener who I think is going to be mortified 
when he asked this question. <laughs> John Dion from Westfield writes... Mortified by the answer. Yes. Hi, Monty and Khalees. I need to vent my frustration about adding the non-word irregardless to the dictionary. I have never considered the opinion of anyone that utters that non-word. I instantly label them a moron if they use it in a sentence, regardless of their academic or social standing. I understand that it is non-standard. It is a double negative, in my opinion. I would like to get Emily Brewster's take on the word. If she agrees, does she have the power to remove it from the dictionary? Do I have the power to remove it from the dictionary? <laughs> he kind of does it in that, like, uh, He-Man Masters of the Universe way. He ends it. Thanks, John Dion, Westfield Mass. I said, we'll ask her, but I promise you, you're not going to like her answer. Irregardless, thank you for submitting your grievance. <laughs> <laughs> Because someone likes to poke tigers. Yes. Emily Brewster. By the way, I would pronounce his last name Dion. Okay. Like Celine? Know. Yeah. Right. Maybe he's Canadian. Maybe his heart is going to go on after this. Because Maybe. Because we're going to break it <laughs> right now. What is your take on behalf of Merriam-Webster, Emily Brewster, in regards to the word irregardless? Mr. Dion is, is in very good company in despising this word, but yes, it is included in our dictionaries and in you know pretty much all the dictionaries that one would consult. One is really very, very likely to see the word irregardless entered there because it is a word. Can you say irregard as verb like you would disregard? No, I, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with that use. Maybe somebody does, but that's not an established use. It really <laughs> is just a, uh, a synonym of regardless, right? We Irregardless, I mean, is just a synonym of regardless. They mean exactly the same thing. Now, he, a lot of people object to it because, like Mr. Dion, they believe that it is a double negative because we are familiar with ear, that prefix I-R being used to, for negation. But in the case of irregardless, that is not what's going on. Uh -huh. In this case, it actually functions as an intensifier. And there are a few other words that have IR at the beginning. None of them are common, right? Um, there's a irresistless means resistless. Uh. Irrelentlessly means relentlessly. I'm going to start in both using of cases, all of these. Well, <laughs> yeah, and you can, right? You can absolutely use them. They are established. They are words that are entered in dictionaries. They are words that have a long history. As far as we know, irregardless goes back to currently the oldest evidence we've found is 1795. Mm. So, you know, if you care about how old a word is, ir irregardless does also have that speaking in its favor, but it uh, it's only been in relatively common use. And it's not a commonly used word, really, irregardless of what people feel, you know, was the frequency that they- You're gonna get um... irrelentless about this, aren't you? <laughs> <laughs> it's, uh, it's only like popped up into the public consciousness as a problematic thing since the early 20th century when it started appearing with more frequency in dialectal use. Yes, we entered in our dictionary, but we also include a very strong note that tells the reader to use regardless instead. Because John Dion from Westfield is going to get really upset if he hears you use it. He's going to try to take it out of your words. <laughs> yeah, well, it's interesting. Like the strength of his assertion, he says, I've, I, would, I have never considered the opinion of anyone that utters that non-word. So the worst thing about irregardless is that it makes people tune you out. And in my opinion, that's the only reason not to use it. It has a meaning. It makes sense. If you recognize that the ear is being an intensifier and not a uh, not a negation, so you know it's it's but yeah, yeah it's it's a word that people only should avoid because of the ire of those who despise the word. Do you mean the ear? <laughs> this works better in print than in the spoken word. These jokes. <laughs> so how do you two feel about the word ear? Regardless, it just feels uncomfortable. In what way, Khalees? Ear is is a prefix that I don't tend to use very often because it just feels kind of unwieldy in the mouth hmm. even with like irresponsible or yeah irrelentless <laughs> which i guess is real like is or... it which is definitely real um it just feels <laughs> like it it's unwieldy in in speaking so i avoid it and because i it feels unwieldy in speaking I also avoid it in writing because I write like I speak. Interesting. So you object to it on kind of aesthetic and phonetic grounds. Yes. <laughs> 
I love it's it. Very interesting. What about the word irregular? I guess the, out of all of them, that is probably the one that I use the most. But I would often just default to unusual. Interesting. All right, Monty. What about you? I love that it makes people so mad. <laughs> of course you do. Of course you do. <laughs> Maybe I'll just start saying that ear means to go in Spanish, and I want to go regardless. Like, I'm going to, like, double down on my regardlessness about this. I'm going to go fully I mean, you're going to start saying regardless. ear around, and people who used to love Invader Zim are going to have their heads whip around at you, thinking that you're talking to them. Okay. I don't know what you're talking about, <laughs> but I'm sure some people do. What is interesting to me about what Mr. John Dion says from Westfield is that he disregards people who use this. I know that Shakespeare used literally, figuratively, and I think that's another one of those words that really drives people nuts. If you grow up hearing the word, or if you are in conversations regularly with people who use the word without any, you know, any kind of recognition that it's objectionable to many people, then it becomes just a normal part of your vocabulary. And there's no, you know, there'd be no reason to avoid using it if there are no negative consequences, if it does the job. You know, the reason to avoid it is just that it fails to do the job of communicating in many cases because people hate it so much. Are there other instances where a prefix has two meanings and one of them just makes everybody kind of misinterpret what it's attached to? Yeah, well, you know, the word disgruntled, that dis means, it doesn't mean un, it doesn't mean not gruntled. So we developed gruntled as kind of a jokey word that is the opposite of disgruntled. The original gruntle meant to grumble. And so the dis was actually, you know, if you were if you were disgruntled, you were grumbling more. More grumbles. More grumbles. Yeah, more, more grumbles. <laughs> yes. But that's not our familiar use of dis. And I don't know of any other words. There are some other words, though, where the dis also behaves unusually language is a habit and we rely on the bits of information we have about its parts and we think that we know what things mean <laughs> and for the most part we do right that's why it functions that's why the language works that's why we can communicate with one another is because we we do share a common understanding of what words mean you know but for some people irregardless means regardless and for other people it means i don't know how to speak english <laughs> For other people, it means you're going to go on a rampage and tear pages out of the dictionary. <laughs> One of the words that confuses me all the time that has an interesting prefix, Emily Brewster, resident wordster from Merriam-Webster, is flammable versus oh. inflammable, both of which mean you can set this on fire. So if people are like, <laughs> oh, I've got my inflammable pajamas on. I'm fire safe tonight going to sleep. No. Turns out, no, you can both get set on fire if you're flammable or inflammable. Yeah. Well, in the prefix in, in inflammable actually doesn't mean not. It means in or into. Right? <laughs> like, to inflame. Oh. That seems so, like so a, that is the most and, dangerous. And flame are basically the same. Or is end yeah. flame even a word? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's in a Merriam Webster's yeah. dictionary there. In flame and end flame. <laughs> yeah. If I were going to pick a word to get out of the dictionary, it would be inflammable in this regard. <laughs> irregardless of what you think about irregardless, because this is dangerous, friends. We can't be putting <laughs> inflammable on things and I... people be like, cool, it's fine. We can set it on fire. Let's have let's have a barbecue around it. I have to say irrelentless is growing on me. Yeah, just me too. Because it's bizarre. <laughs> <laughs> well, OK, there, but there's a good question in what you just said, Monty. When should should a word be removed from the dictionary? And when like, are they removed from the dictionary? Now that you've got the the breadth and depth of the internet to keep adding words, are words being removed? Well, it depends on what kind of dictionary. Certainly for an unabridged dictionary, we do not remove words unless there's a really good reason. And those reasons are usually about the word being covered at a different entry in a different way, or uh, if it's a you know a horribly offensive word that nobody has used in 200 years anyway, we're just gonna we're just gonna throw that one out. But for the most part, that is a very, very small set of words. For an unabridged dictionary, you just keep adding, just keep adding and adding. But a book that is a print dictionary, that is 
has to be portable and affordable. Sure, we do have to remove words, but then it's based on, you know, is the word really functioning actively in the language anymore? And if it's really not, if it's not, it's not even in books people are reading because a word doesn't have to be functioning in everyday spoken language for it to qualify for entry. It can also be used in books that people are frequently reading. So if Shakespeare's plays include this word, then, well, people are likely to want to know what it means. Can you think of words that Merriam-Webster has had to remove in that regard? I mean, the unabridged dictionary used to have an entry for color film, for example. Uh. And you just don't need that anymore. Like you cover it at the entry for color and you cover it at the entry for film mm -hmm. and nobody is looking up color film. So like that that's the kind of boring deletion that happens that nobody cares about. And to be honest, that is the kind of deletion that we are inclined to make. Yeah. We don't we don't want to remove words that people are like, wait a minute, I know this used to be here. We want to we want to remove the words when we remove them. Um, words that that are really nobody nobody cares about this word. Or the word <laughs> is covered in a different way. We wouldn't remove, for example, a word like mimeograph, but there are words related to the technology of mimeograph machines that might be considered for for deletion. Children, a mimeograph machine. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a copy machine, which you probably also don't know what that is. Mimeographs were way more fun because they were more interactive. Like you had to put the paper in through the rolly thing and then crank the roll. It was like the best assignment when your teacher let you go work the mimeograph machine to make copies. But you couldn't take pictures of your butt with it like you can on a copy machine. No, you'd have to roll through the machine and they kind of frowned upon that. Yes. <laughs> now you're imagining rolling through the yes, mimeograph machine. Yes, I am. I like how they de-juiced de 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 Violet Beauregard and Willy Wonka's factory. Yeah, it's okay. Exactly. exactly, yes, yes. I got a blueberry for a daughter. But do words belong in dictionaries, even though people like words that people hate? Do words that people hate belong in a dictionary? Personally, I think I strongly think they do, because if words are being used, people need a resource that they can trust to find out what those words mean. And Merriam-Webster is the dictionary of note in this country, Oxford English Dictionary, perhaps in the UK. These are important resources, as opposed to Urban Dictionary, which I love. It's also another resource. But yes, all these words that are being used belong in dictionaries. Khalees, what do you think? Yeah, they belong in dictionaries. Like it's a marker of language and how it gets or got used, especially as historical document and a growing historical document. It's important for them to be there. Yeah, I agree. I think also in the case of irregardless, you know, there is a note there that tells people you might want to avoid this word. And so a, a dictionary can comment on a word like that and provide information about what the consequences of using a particular word are. We also include a lot of offensive words and we include information at the entry that tells people why they should not use this word, why there may be negative consequences for them if they choose to use that word. Mm -hmm. That's really important information that a dictionary provides. Descriptive rather than prescriptive is the way that Merriam-Webster runs the dictionary. Having prescriptive language seems awfully authoritarian. Yeah. <laughs> but maybe that's We have just a tagline. <laughs> authoritative, not authoritarian. I like that. <laughs> nice. <laughs> and I'm sorry to tell you, John Dion from Westfield, you're going to have to put the pitchfork down. I warned you that you weren't going to like Emily Brewster's answer in regards to irregardless being stricken from the dictionary. But we do Thank you for asking the question. We've got another listener question that we'll get to next week from Claire Morneau about craven and mortified and their usage slippage. You can always strike it from your personal vocabulary, and the only thing in this world you can really control is yourself. Right. <laughs> but maybe you should be more open-minded, John Dion, because irregardless, oh, no. people are going to continue to use this word. Yeah, it just sounds weird, but that doesn't mean it's not real. Right. Two <laughs> other things. One. Emily Brewster and I are going to be on an a upcoming episode of the Judge John Hodgman podcast together, Ooh. wherever podcasts yes, are available, too. through the now uh, cooperatively owned Maximum Fun podcasting network. That'll be either this week or next week, I think. Right, Emily Brewster? I think so, yeah. And like John, Dion, and Claire Morneau, you can send us whatever your linguistic queries are, thefab413 at nepm.org or 1-800-639-9120. Thank you, Emily Brewster. Oh, thank you, Monty and Khalees. <laughs>
Apologies to the irregardless haters out there. If you've got a question, again, anytime you want to ask it of the word nerd, email us at the fab413 at nepm.org or text us at 800-639-9120. And I just looked. The Judge John Hodgman podcast that features both Emily Brewster and me dropped today. Ooh. You're listening to The Fabulous 413 on NEPM. Welcome back to The Fabulous 413. I'm Monty Belmonte. And I'm Cleese Smith. Friday, we will be on the road broadcasting live, live from the brand new Greenfield Public Library. As we continue our accidental tour of libraries throughout Western Mass because they're all fascinating. Love Every it. one of them. And we are going to have harp music live from Maeve Gilchrist. Who is wicked cool. And from... if you've never heard of her, she plays harp in the most interesting ways. So yes. come on down and see her live. And we're going to have a very special, very famous author co-host as part of the show on Friday as well. But tomorrow on The Fabulous 413, MSNBC's Rachel Maddow. And she'll be bringing along the co-host of her new podcast, Deja News, Isaac Davey Aronson, all about history repeating. And we'll also have our weekly check-in with Representative Jim McGovern. If you've got a question for Rachel Maddow or the congressman, email us at thefab413 at nepm.org or text 800-639-9120 and we'll ask on air. I'm Monty Belmonte. I'm Khalees Smith. We'll see you tomorrow in The Fabulous 413.